Hi, my friend. Oh, I hope, yeah, we are we are ready for your surgery. Yeah. Well, okay. The th thank you very much to to invite me and my team to broadcast this surgery. So uh, uh, it is always a very very great pleasure to be in contact with you, with my Turkish colleagues from uh, Istanbul. Um, we have a very very nice relationship uh, together and. Uh, a, a good friendship so I, I am pleased to to broadcast this surgery this morning and to join you uh, for uh, Thursday and uh, Friday to the Congress it, it's a pleasure for me to come back in in Istanbul which is one of the most uh, uh, beautiful city in the world without any doubt so to, to perform this surgery, I choose a, a young patient without uh, uh, surgical antecedents, thin. So I think I, I will be able to perform a very didactic procedure. And if you, if you have a look at, this, at her pelvis, you will see all the anatomic structures we have to, uh, we have to preserve. So uh, you have here the right fallopian tube, right ovary. You can see here the right ureter, the right hypogastric artery, the right hypogastric vein, and the right hypogastric nerve, while the right uterosacral ligament is here, medially, here. Then we have the rectum with a big endometriosis nodule, which explains all the complaints. So the patient has uh, defecation pain and dyskesia because the nodule infiltrates the rectum, the mid rectum on three centimeter with a protrusion into the lumen. She has right sciatic pain because into the death the nodule comes on contact with the S3 and S4 and the pain is, uh, is sent into the uh, sciatic nerve through the connection of the sacral plexus. Then she has deep dyspareunia because the vagina is in contact, maybe not uh, completely infiltrated, but we feel very well the nodule on the posterior and right cul de sac. And she has uh, simply uh, pelvic pain. You can see that here we have a lesion on the contact with the left hypogastric nerve. This is superficial, and we have to preserve the left hypogastric nerve because I think we can, we should uh, cut the left, the right hypogastric nerve. And if you cut the both hypogastric nerves, the patient will have a trouble or feeling of, uh, of the bladder. So she do not longer uh, uh, have the feeling of uh, full, full uh, bladder. And then we have to preserve the splanchnic nerves on the right side because uh, on, on the left side, because on the right side, they are into the nodule. So I think we have to cut them the splanchnic nerves on the right side. It means that she can void the bladder after the surgery only with the left side. So we have to do a nerve spurring, particularly on the left side, because on the right side, the surgery, the excision will be large like this. Okay, so as you see, uh, to, to make the procedure more didactic, I uh, perform the suspension of the right ovary and also of the sigmoid colon. And uh, let's go. I propose you to start by the excision of the less severe uh, lesion on the, on the left side. So may I introduce my team? So I am Horace Roman. I am French, but uh, <coughs> I am born in Romania. So uh, I know very, very well the history of, uh, of your country because uh, we had a lot of uh, relationship uh, through, through the history. Here you have a, a guy from Greece. So uh, he knows very well the history too. Here is the guy who comes very from far, from Canada. So here is uh, um, Georgios Grigoriadis. Uh, here we have uh, Bach and Guyen. Behind me, we have uh, Sari Bulos from Israel. Here is uh, Milen, which is my uh, private uh, nurse. Uh, then we have uh, Audrey. This is nurse, she helps, he helped us uh, from the, um, uh, for the operative room. And here we have the most uh, beautiful uh, anesthesiologist of the southwest of uh, Europe, uh, David Castera. And Tariq is uh, in the behind, is the technical staff. 
So we are ready to start. We are ready to start. So we have um, one hour and a half, two hour procedure. Uh, you, will, uh, you will see uh, at the end uh, the general surgeon. I will come, I will uh, call him to perform the, it's enregistré, it's okay. Uh, I will call him to perform the suture of the rectum because in France, the suture of the rectum should be done by a uh, colorectal surgeon. So let's go. I will incise the peritoneum and I will let the pneumoperitoneum pushing away the left hypogastric nerve. Yes, he should be here. Georgios, please take the peritoneum like this. So wha where is the nerve? It is here. Here. So we have to preserve it. Hold, hold, hold like this. Okay. So I, I was delighted to, to hear the presentation of uh, Ludovico Muzzi. <coughs> Wonderful. Yeah. The uh, the left ureter is here. I saw I saw it. There you can you can see it is here. It goes there. So as as we stay on contact with uh, with the peritoneum, <coughs> I do not uh, dissect it more than uh, that. Okay, very well. So the, the ureter is, is right here. At this level, it is more into the death. It is here. It goes farther, take a distance from the peritoneum, so there is no danger. Now, let's go on the other side. So the strategy of uh, the excision of uh, parametrial nodules, in my opinion, should follow 10 steps. And I published them in a recent paper in Fertility and Sterility. So we'll start by performing the ureterolysis. This is the first step. And we have to perform the ureterolysis down to the cardinal ligament. Because uh, we, can, uh, sec we can injury the, rect the ureter until this level. So we have to dissect it completely and to see very well where it belongs. I am eager to join you tomorrow because um, after this two year COVID period, I am eager to see back my, uh, my friends from uh, Turkey, from Italy, um, Stefano Angioni which is a very old friend. We met together the first time in uh, 2006. Well, so we continue. So the, the, the ureter is here. You see it very well. Is there. So we'll continue to incise the peritoneum medially from the, from the ureter, but we have to follow it down to the to the cardinal ligament because the danger to injure it is here the nodule can attract the ureter and uh, we can encounter it uh, at this level four years ago uh, I uh, have started uh, reducing the dissection, uh, the thorough dissection of the, of the ureter, and I had two ureteral injuries at this level because the ureter was attracted like this, and when I cut like this, I was inside the ureter. So this is the ureterolysis. Very well. Now, the second step is opening the pararectal space. 
So we'll go medially, medially from, uh, from the uterosacral ligaments, and we'll try to find, no, let, let it down, we'll try to find the dissection plane, meaning that I pick a hole and I try to see where the pneumoperitoneum goes. Here. And I will release the lateral rectal wall. So here we are medially from, uh, from the uterosacral ligament and from the um, uh, hypogastric nerve. So we preserve, with in this dissection plane, we will preserve all the nerves. And also we'll have a look, we'll identify the lateral rectal wall. And this is most useful to prepare the, to prepare the disc excision. So we'll try to perform a disc excision because uh, on the low rectum, I think the disc excision may be uh, related to better, to better functional outcomes, even though I could not uh, clearly demonstrate it in the, in the endorandomized trial. And uh, I have an idea why I could not uh, demonstrate it, because uh, I in this trial, which compared conservative surgery to colorectal resection, I did not um, enroll only low rectal nodule, but also upper rectal nodule, where both techniques are similar. And uh, also, I uh, could not avoid the denervation of the rectum in uh, large endometriosis. And the denervation of the rectum, I think it plays a role as as uh, important as the um, rectal shape. So here I dissected the lateral rectal wall. You see the rectal wall here. The nerves are outside. The hypogastric nerve uh, is right here. It's actually a very, very nice anatomy. And uh, I hope you enjoy it until the end. I think we'll, we'll see all the including the sacra roots, I, I will see all the anatomical uh, structures of, of this uh, region. Now, the first step is going in the front in order to look for the rectovaginal space healthy below the rectum. But to do this, I will also open the space on the other side Because I need to to know very well the direction. Push push the the rectum like this. I have to identify very well the direction of the rectum. So here we have the left rectal wall. like this. We'll go laterally in order to remove this, this endometriosis lesion. So here we are into the, on the left side on the rectum, you see the rectum here. Anyway, to perform a disc excision, we have to release both, um, both lateral rectal wall. Okay. This is endometriosis too. Very well. Now, from this side, you can see that the rectovaginal space is there. So here is the vagina, here is the rectum. It means that if I come on the, on the frontal plane, I have to reach this, this direction, this plane. So now 
once I see where I have to go, I can release the rectum, and this is the first step. Could you clean, because I think we have a... Very well. Okay, now, we release the rectum on the right side. We release the rectum on the left side. Now, we have to reach the rectal vaginal space by incising, by separating the rectum from the nodule. And if you finish the dissection on the lateral wall, you can easily do it in the front. Like this. You see, the healthy rectal space is here. What you have to avoid is to, to reach this space uh, by a dissection play which is into the rectal wall, because in this case you have to, you have to take more rectal wall into the disc excision. So let's see, let's make sure where is the vagina, where is the rectum. Okay. Very well. I am so excited to come in uh, Istanbul again. Bec uh, at the point that I spent my weekend by reading uh, the um, reading again because I like very much the history. Reading again the all this period where um, in the of the 15th century, where um, Mehmed II uh, defeated uh, Constantine XI and uh, and uh, um, took the Constantinople. So I'm I'm I'm eager to be there and uh, to to visit with uh, <coughs> Stefano. <coughs> Stefano. <coughs> Um, Hagia Sophia and uh, all, uh, all the downtown. So I remember two, two, two years ago, three years ago before COVID, I, I was there and I enjoyed and I uh, told to my, uh, my friend Unku, don't worry, I, I'm sure I will come back because uh, I feel so fine with, uh, with you in, in, uh, in Istanbul. <laughs> Dr. Bastu is speaking. We are also happy to see you, uh, and also we are uh, waiting for you. Sorry, you, you can. We are also happy that we will see you. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, I, I first I understood that you do not longer see me on uh, on the on the. Um, the movie. Okay, so here we are below, below the nodule because as you see we have fat tissue and the fat tissue tells us that we are below, below the level of the nodule. And here it bleeds because I think I am more into the vagina than into the rectovaginal space. The rectovaginal space should not bleed. And if I have a bleeding, it means that I am either into the vagina, into the vagina or into the rectum. I think I'm rather into the vagina. Okay, very well. So here you are below the nodule. Here you see the rectal wall. Okay. 
Okay, I think I think it's not so bad. Uh, I will perform the hemostasis and then we'll identify the structures and we'll see if we have to go a bit farther into the into the rect of a general space. So here we have a lot of, uh, in this tissue, we have a lot of uh, vessels coming uh, transversally from outside to inside. Uh, we always uh, meet them. So you should be ready to, to coagulate and cut them. Okay. So here we are into the fat tissue lateral and medially from the nodule and below. Okay, here you are on the uh, levatorani muscles. So I have to continue to release here because I think I am not in the right plane. I am just in the front of the right plane. That's why I had some uh, bleeding here. So you see here is the fascia of the rectovaginal space while the rectum is here. Okay. So this is a fascia which is used by uh, the colleagues who perform urogynecology through the vaginal route. But uh, we do not need to to leave it on the on the, the on, on the rectum because uh, it we have to separate. Ora. Yes. May I ask you a question? I'm Stefano. Stefano, yeah, your I friend. You, Stefano. Of course, I <laughs> you. Nice surgery. Nice surgery. Congratulations. I ask you one question. You are very expert, so you. You, uh, uh, in every moment, you know where you are. But uh, don't you think that uh, could help uh, uh, to put some, uh, like a sponge inside the rectum to see better, or inside the posterior fornix to see better the separation between uh, rectum and vagina? Could help in uh, less expert surgeons in this step? Uh, honestly, it does not help me. It yes, I agree. Because uh, uh, if I put something into the rectum, I will uh, fill in this uh, space I want to open. You see, this is the space. This is, this is the rectum, and this is the rectovaginal fascia. And if I put something into the rectum, I do not longer see it very well. While into the vagina, I uh, always put my finger when I open the vagina. But but otherwise, I. I know that some some colleagues may be uh, may find this useful because this is a question I uh, I uh, hear very very frequently and I, I know that uh, many colleagues used to put uh, it and I think you you too but uh, honestly I do not think that me I, I do not I, I, do, I have no benefit into the rectum, I think I, I put something only at a very, very precise moment when I want to, to prepare the rectal wall for disc excision. So we'll see that uh, at the end of the surgery to prepare the rectal wall, probably I will put something into the rectum, but uh, to do the dissection, I it does not help me actually, but it can be done. So here, here I separate the, the rectum, here is the rectum, huh? from this nodule. Okay, so we will put it into the front and then we'll take them out. And I have to continue the, to separate the rectum from the rectovaginal fascia like this. So this is the good plane, but And you see, it does not bleed. So if you dissect this and you have a, a bleeding in your dissection plane, it means you're not in the right plane. 
your radar into the into the vagina. Usually, we are into the vagina much more frequently than into the rectum. Dependent wire. Could you clean? Perfect. Okay. Salondan soru sormak isteyen varsa mikrofonla İngilizce konuşarak sorabilir ya da bana sorabilir ben ona söyleyebilirim. Büyülenmiş gibi izliyorsunuz. Bundan böyle görünüyor ya. Yani. <gülüyor> Var mı? You do not have, uh, have the view. Uh, do you see me? Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah we, see, we see it's very clear horse. Yeah, we are watching very carefully and so, so, so you Every, know, everybody was impressed here with your surgery and the, we have young guys and young surgeons in audience and so they are very impressed in your surgery. They're watching and listening. Thank it's you very because, clear. Because I, I, so here you see the infiltration of the rectum. So I, I will put this uh, in the front. So this infiltration looks like what we saw in the MRI. So usually before starting a surgery, I have to see the surgical steps. And to do this, I need to read myself the MRI and to understand where the nodule is placed and how the dissection will, uh, will run. That's why I was sure that it will happen like this. So here we have uh, an infiltration of about three centimeter and we'll be able to remove it with the disc excision. You see? So this was the first step. This was the first step of my 10 step procedure of excision of deep endometriosis nodule of the paramecium. Now, the first step it has already done uh, the identification of the hypogastric nerves. You see it here. But honestly, when I see the direction, look, it goes directly into the nodule. So I am almost sure, I'm, I'm sure 100% that we cannot preserve it. So let's go to the fifth step. The fifth step is the dissection of uh, hypogastric artery and vein. Take it. And I do it because the nodule, as you can see, the nodule is here and it goes down. It goes until here. So if we cut here directly, we'll fall on, on the um, hypogastric, uh, uh, the branches of the hypogastric vein and they are very difficult to control if you do not, uh, if you do not prepare the hypogastric vein, so you may have some uh, very uncomfortable bleeding. That's why I uh, advise everybody, and particularly the young colleagues, to start by uh, identifying the hypogastric artery and vein, and if necessary, to ligate the branches which go into the nodule. So if you have some some vein going into the nodule, you have to clip them and to cut them. There's no need to turn around for uh, one hour because uh, uh, they should be uh, cut at the end. So let me see. The hypogastric artery should be here, just, just below. I will cut this to completely release the, the ureter. Yeah. So the hypogastric artery is there. Now you have to don't, don't push the the ureter like this because uh, I put it like this rather. So the hypogastric artery is here. I will open a bit more. Uh, 
And then we can control all the vessels running into the nodule. Okay, so hypogastric artery is here. Very well, and the hypogastric vein is just below. We saw it very well uh, through the peritoneum. Now I, I, I open the peritoneum, we see it a bit less, but it is there. So we perform all the incisions in the longitudinal plane in order to avoid cutting, uselessly cutting the nerves, because here, on the here in this place, we have uh, the inferior hypogastric plexus, which coordinates not only the bladder but also uh, also the um, uh, the um, left colon and the rectum. And if you cut everything on both sides the patient will have uh, a very embarrassing uh, uh, constipation. Now, so let's stay a while. Here we have the right ureter. Here we have the hypogastric artery. Here just below we have the hypogastric vein, while the sacra roots are here. The sacral roots are behind the, dam, the vein and in the front of the piriform muscle, so they are here. And we will see them in a couple Horse of you can. Horse you can. Uh, I, I remember that the, the previous surgeries uh, you were doing, uh, you were using the bipolar cautery and in, in both hands, and now you are using harmonic, right, on the right hand? Yeah, I... To I change your... I, I use the, the harmonic, the, this kind of harmonic, which is very sharp. Um, but if, if I encounter veins, I, I will rather put the clips. So this, this harmonic it helps me a lot to the dissection because it is, it is very sharp. So here we have some nerves. But uh, the, the bipolar is my uh, favorite instrument. Now, s since last year, I have started to perform this surgery almost exclusively with robotic assistance. So this one of the rare patients I, I carry out in, uh, in laparoscopy and uh, probably next year, if you invite me to do the same thing, I will uh, perform a robotic surgery because at this moment I cannot broadcast the, the robotic surgeries. That's why uh, I, I still uh, I, I do only laparoscopy in, uh, in uh, live surgery, but next year we'll be, uh, we have, we'll have the equipment to perform also the robotic surgery because uh, the robotic instruments are, uh, are not straight and they are, uh, they are very sharp. So I try to use uh, the instruments as sharp as I can in order to perform uh, the right dissection. And uh, well, here we are at the posterior limit of the nodule. So now if you want to remove the nodule, we have to cut in this plane and then to go there. And you see here we have some veins. So you see that here in this plane I, I need some clips because I will have veins into the nodule, while here I have only uh, the arteries. And I will try to preserve all this spider web because inside there are some nerves, but uh, I can preserve them only if they are a distance from the nodule. So this was the, the sixth and the seventh step, the dissection of hypogastric artery and her branches and hypogastric vein, while the sacral roots are right here and we'll see them once we remove uh, the nodule. Okay, now let's go back, uh, no, no, the photo. Let's go back to dissect this, this uh, limit of the nodule, the lateral limit. It's, it's 
so we have to cut this because it is in contact with uh, with the nodule. So here is a healthy place. Here we have a nodule, so we have to cut this. Horace, yeah. could you could you describe us uh, for us in the, the, the just the exact place of nodule that you are planning to remove then? Yes. So, so we are discussing where is the nodule. Yes. <laughs> so the nodule is, as you you can you can also uh, have a look back on the MRI. So it shows that the nodule is here. Uh, into the into the rectovaginal space, it comes he is, it starts here. It goes there, there, there. It's going up on yeah. the right side and going up, right? Until here, and here it goes into the diff because here when I push with my aspirator I, I feel that it's very hard and I think it start it stops here on contact with uh, the sacra roots. Here it, it stops it stops uh, here mm -hmm. so we can cut there, there, there and the exterior limit should be here. Because here I feel it is it is soft. So we'll remove all this part from there to there to there until the sacral root coming here and there. But to, to cut here, I needed to, to see very well the plane of the, of the artery on the vein and the branches because here we'll use the clip. You will see it is impossible to remove this without cutting two or three uh, large veins. That's why we, we cannot, in my opinion, it is, it is risky to do not to do not dissect this and to continue to cut here because at this level you will have uh, you will have an inadvertent uh, hemorrhage. So now I go on the lateral lateral limit. So here you see it is normal. Here it looks also normal. Here we have we have a, an artery. I cannot tell you exactly each time what what kind of artery we have because uh, below the ureter there are several uh, clip. There are several uh, veins which are not uh, not uh, regular. But I know they are they are there because I uh, always encounter them in this uh, in this surgery. Okay. And once we go behind the the plane of uh, could you clean <coughs> the plane of the arteries will be in the pla on the plane of the vein clean better. Very well. Okay. Okay. Here we have to go millimeter, millimeter by millimeter in order to make sure uh, it's not a very good view. Just a moment, sorry for this uh, movement, but I, I want to send you a very very nice uh, view because it is very important to see the to see the. Um, the connection and all the anatomic structure. So here you are on the ureter. Here we have the plane of the arteries. And then once we cut this, here we go uh, into the vein. And here the bipolar and the harmony scalpers are less less efficient because the vein are more difficult to control. So we will use the clip, bipolar. Here I will take the bipolar. Here is the nodule. <coughs> But that's why I, <coughs> I told you that a surgeon performing this this surgery should should look at the MRI himself with with his own eyes and not just look at the report because you have you have to understand very very well where the lesion 
belongs and where are the limits and maybe uh, maybe the um, augmented reality will be a wonderful solution to see to see uh, to see the limits of the lesion but until the augmented reality will be efficient in endometriosis we have to to do like this so we have to look at the mri with our eye, eyes and to try to imagine to to see the surgery the day before so honestly yesterday evening i i was sure it it will happen like this bipolar so here you see we have a big vein so if you do not see if you do not have if you have not dissected the vein proximally you can and you dissect only here you can go inside with the tip of your instrument <laughs> to create a, a hemorrhage and uh, honestly i think it is very very difficult to to control when you have a, a big hemorrhage from the from the bottom of your dissection plane without knowing where the where the vein comes from and where uh, it goes. Now see, so here we have a big vein, and even my uh, clip is is not enough large. That's why I have to dissect it a bit more. Or maybe I can try to dissect here because uh, probably I can control it rather there. It looks like a carrefour between uh, several big veins. And just behind we have the sacral root. So we should do something like this. Now I think I, I have performed more than 100 of procedure like this. And I know very well where I have to go and what I have to, what kind of uh, problem I have to avoid. But when I started the surgery, and uh, that time it was uh, impossible to see, uh, to see move, to see movies like this one. It was difficult to understand. Uh, I had four big hemorrhages from this. Uh, from this uh, step and two of them needed to be converted in uh, in uh, open surgery and now I think I understand how to avoid this uh, this event by dissecting like this clip I think that there are two ma two major difficult point of this uh, of the surgery of uh, the parametrium is to control the vein and second is not to injury the sacral roots but you will see the sacral roots are not very difficult to to find <coughs> and you will see them very very well in uh, maybe in 15 minutes Okay, we have also to do this. So here we are always outside the nodule because from this point the nodule goes in a posterior direction. If you look at the MRI, it goes through uh, toward the, the third sacra root. Uh, bipolar. I have to clip this uh, this tissue in order to avoid to injure it with the tip of my uh, clip. Very well. Okay. And we 
will arrive on the vein. And here maybe I will stop and uh, it, it will be better to, re to release everything here and then to pull the nodule medially in order to see better this dissection plane. So I, I will abandon uh, this dissection plane, lateral dissection plane for uh, a couple of minutes. And I will remove, I will remove this uh, peritoneum because I'm not sure it is very healthy. Now here I'm on contact with the hypogastric nerve, but as you see it goes into the nodule, so it is no, uh, no mean to preserve it. And here are back in the plane of veins, so uh, I have to slow down and to see very well what I cut at any moment. Very well. Could you clean, please? Okay, very well. Now let's dissect gently right now. Here we have some splanchnic nerves because they, uh, they, uh, come from the from the sacral root to reach the inferior hypogastric plexus and here i am here may be maybe a sacral root the fourth sacral root which is uh, completely aspirated by the nodule so let's dissect gently and sort and uh, do not cut it, but I think it may be it may be a sacral root. It comes from the from behind the vein and it goes behind the vein. As you can see, it goes behind the vein. So let's take care, particular care to it. Horus, uh, we know the story of this Horus. Horus, you can. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, we know the uh, yeah. Okay, we know the story of patients, and she has right. Uh, uh, cyclic pain on the right side. Uh, do you think that it's uh, rising from the this the, the this nodule? That's that's sure doing the surgery. That in that area is causing the the, the, the pain. Um, wh where is the nodule of the of of your patient? Where where is the nodule located? No, no, I'm, I'm talking about this patient. Ah, this patient. Yes, I, I'm sure. Yeah. Yes, I'm sure because uh, uh, as as the nodule comes on contact with the with the sacral roots in the pelvis, you can stimulate or uh, or compress a sacral roots and to have uh, to have the pain uh, going uh, going in a territory which is innervated but an over sacral roots and uh, this uh, diffusion of the this diffusion of the um, uh, um, sensation, maybe uh, of the feeling, is some sometime useful because you know uh, we we use uh, the Eurostim to to stimulate uh, the splanchnic nerves and to restore the bladder function when the patient have uh, the difficulties to <coughs> difficulties to void the bladder. And uh, the Eurostim stimulates the posterior uh, uh, tibial nerve, which is a branch of the of the sciatic nerve, and it goes the the stimulation goes posteriorly backward to to sacral plexus and then to um, to splanchnic nerves. So I I think. In, in this this patient with a nodule on contact with the S3 and S4 has no region to have a pain in the sciatic nerve which comes from uh, L5 to S2. 
but uh, it is very likely that uh, the um, the pain diffuses through the through this uh, nervous network and uh, it gets this uh, sciatic pain and i'm sure that after the surgery she will not longer have it so here here we are on the on the plane of the of the sacral roots and uh, i i will be able to show you another one right here but you have to go below below the vein here so here is the plane of sacral roots here and there to, to see another one we have to dissect there we have to go behind the behind the vein but let's finish the the nodule and then we'll see at the we have a look at the anatomy so the nodule goes there so we'll continue to release it from from the posterior plane So this this is the a very deep space where the gynecologist usually do not go because they have nothing to do uh, except to perform a sacral colpopexy but it is much the plane of the dissection in sacral colpopexy is much anterior it, it is there while well here we are actually on the on the deep parameter parametrium and I think Excepted the pelvectomy in cervical cancer and uh, the deep endometriosis of the parametrium, we do not uh, we do not need to to go uh, into the depth. That's why I I used to propose this this kind of surgery uh, for uh, life surgery because. Uh, I think it's from an anatomical point of view, it's interesting, particularly for young colleagues. Okay, so here we are on the <coughs> on the muscle on the bottom of the pelvis. So we'll continue to release the nerve, uh, the the nodule, and on the MRI, it has been. It was obvious that. We have to reach this plane in order to remove it because uh, it develops into the death until the elevator any muscles. Okay, very well. Now, now you can see where the nodule belonged. So it was there, infiltrated the rectum and come in contact with uh, the sacral plexus, which is here. Give me the uh, bipolar. Bipolar and uh, uh, trans. Okay, so the, the sacral roots are in this, in this plane. very posterior stay, stay right Why are you dissecting that area? Is there any no, just, nodule? Just just show show here, here we have one. Here we have one. You have? Here we have one of them. What do we show about the other? Here. You can see, I, I, I feel it very well. 
it is here. Here is this one. It should be the it should be the third one. This one. Uh -huh. So the the the plane of of sacra roots is here. You see. It is below that of the vein, which is come come back. So once again, we have the ureter, we have the plane of arteries here, we have the plane of vein, and below we have the sacral roots. And if we cut this, if we cut the hypogastric vein like this, just behind there is the origin of the sciatic nerve. But I do this only when I uh, and I have big nodules coming from there down to to sciatic nerve. But the, the plane of the, the, the sciatic nerve is right here, behind the vein. Okay, now let's come back and uh, to finish with this uh, vein. And uh, in this way, we'll, we'll finish the, the lateral, uh, lateral um, limit. Come, come closer to see uh, exactly where is where are the vein uh, clip. I think we have one here and another one just behind. Okay. You have to, to to take care each time not to not to leave some uh, nodule uh, behind because it will be very very difficult or almost impossible to come back and uh, to to pick it up. Uh, clip. So clip and then, then the plane will be completely free. Okay. You see. So here we are, in the, actually in the in the right place, healthy place. But this small nerve, we have to cut it because we cannot preserve it more. <coughs> okay, now let's see. We have the nodule, we have the lateral pelvic wall with the vein we have to oh this this was the vein uh, difficult to remove no not that one uh, we, we were too too deep okay so we'll continue now we have to cut this and then we'll remove it from the vagina and then we we'll finish by the by the disc excision now hold this please I will release it a bit from uh, from the front. Here always we have uh, big veins. It is very difficult not to have any bleeding during the surgery. So I, I try I try to avoid the bleeding, but uh, usually uh, I have a vein which I which I missed, but. All the time they are in this direction, transversal direction, so I have no uh, no problem to to control them. Maybe next year, if you wish, I can plan a robotic surgery uh, excision of a deep endometriosis of a sciatic nerve. Because uh, there we for the sciatic nerve we have a completely different uh, anatomy, and I think it is very very interesting from a, an uh, anatomic point of view to 
to show this, even though it is a very rare surgery and uh, it's sure that uh, we cannot afford to have uh, 100 uh, specialists in uh, deep endometriosis of, of the sciatic nerve because there are not enough cases to <coughs> help them to become um, to become experts. But uh, it's it's a very very interesting uh, uh, from an anatomical point of view. And uh, I remember that uh, a couple of months ago I carried out uh, such case with a colleague, uh, which is. Profess professor, which uh, teaches the anatomy to students, and he told me that after the surgery, for the first time, he actually understood the anatomy of the lateral pelvis because uh, until that he has good knowledge on nerves, on but this knowledge were separated, and uh, after the surgery, he he could ultimately put this puzzle, build this puzzle uh, together and uh, to have a, so to have a, a good view of the, the wall, uh, the wall lateral pelvis. So if we can plan this, it, it will be maybe interesting. Because uh, uh, tomorrow uh, Mario Maltoni will carry out a uh, rectal uh, endometriosis. Uh, today I carry out a rectal endometriosis. So uh, there are a lot of cases of rectal endometriosis uh, on his uh, YouTube channel, on my YouTube channel. So maybe we, we can move to another, another procedure. Um, this is just a suggestion. Of course, <coughs> you were using you were using conventional laparoscopy till next year, a year ago, and, and you started the, the robotic surgery in a year ago. Hey, what do you think about the, uh, the difference in, in terms of the endometriosis surgery, uh, the robotics and conventional? Well, I, I, sta I started the robotic surgery in 2011, <coughs> and I was among the the first endometriosis surgeon to, to, to test the robot after three years I I stopped it but more due to, to a lack of organization around the robot in uh, in my past uh, hospital uh, and now uh, in Bordeaux I started uh, again and there are some very clear indications for me so uh, the first one is the diaphragmatic endometriosis I think there is no comparison between uh, the diaphragmatic the quality of the surgery of the diaphragmatic endometriosis done with the robot and in laparoscopy because uh, the, the in my opinion the difference is huge um, then the second case, the second indication is the sciatic nerve. I think also there is no, th there is difficult to do, uh, we, we can do, of course we can do, but uh, I think it's difficult to have the, the same quality of the dissection in laparoscopy than in robotic surgery for the sciatic nerve. Then for the sacral plexus now you you see that the sacral plexus it works very well in laparoscopy of course everything it's okay but uh, in very very large nodule of the parametrium because this is not a very very large one uh, i think the robotic surgery is superior and then the last indication is the low rectum deep endometriosis of low rectum i think in robotic surgery or uh, probably easier to carry out so there are for me the the the four indications but uh, uh, and then the, the last indication is the urologic uh, um, endometriosis so uh, the endometriosis where we have to reimplant the ureter because our colleague ure urologist are much more uh, at ease now in robot than in laparoscopy so this would be my my main indications for um, for robotic surgery, but uh, with this indication, I can uh, 
I can uh, fill the opera fill in the operative uh, program one day a week. So usually I perform uh, one day a week laparoscopy with four uh, four major procedures and uh, uh, another uh, day a week um, I carry out robotic surgery with uh, three cases usually during one day. Now let's see uh, what we did. So as you can see, the nodule is here. The nodule is here. It, it is still attached to the vagina. Here we have the infiltration on the rectum. I completely removed the infiltration of the paramecium. So it was a nodule not going towards the sciatic nerve, but toward the, the um, three and four sacra roots, so here. So if, if you have a look at my uh, last paper in uh, Journal of Minimal Invasive Gynecology about uh, endometriosis of sacral roots and uh, sciatic nerve, I think there are two types of deep endometriosis involving the sacral plexus and sciatic nerve. There is a type one, which is this kind of nodule on contact with the vagina, the rectum, and involving the most frequently the S3 and S4. And there is, uh, it represents maybe eight 80, 85 percent of uh, cases, and then there are the type two, the nodule, or much more lateral. We find them here, and usually they do not involve the rectum, except it when they are very, very, very, very large. But usually, to dissect them, we have to go there, and laterally from the uh, iliac external iliac vessel. So the nodule is there into the depth. But if we cut this artery and this vein, we are, we have the communication between uh, the two uh, the two sides, and that's what my colleague anatom anatomist said that by cutting this he, he saw the connection between the two uh, the two sides. So here we have a type one nodule, and uh, probably maybe next year I will propose you a type two nodule, which are rare. Uh, I used to do it one every month or two months. So the dissection is here in a different anatomic plane. Now, I come back to the advice of uh, Stefano and to remove the nodule from the vagina, I think I have to put a finger into the, into the vagina. And this is different when I perform the robotic surgery because I am far from the vagina. So usually in robotic surgery, my assistant puts the finger into the vagina, but here I like to, to do it on my finger because I think that I feel very well the infiltration. So here I feel it is free, the vagina is free. Here I'm on the cervix, the cervix is there and the nodule is there, I feel it very well and I feel it until there, here is free. So. I will start by looking for my finger on contact with the cervix. So my finger is here, I feel it. I said that I did not see the, the transfixant infiltration of the vagina, however, and I put the finger I, I feel so so well the nodule, then uh, I am almost sure it there is an infiltration of the vagina, but I will try to shave the vagina to see what's happened. And if it is not satisfactory, I will take a patch of the vagina. So my finger is here, here I everything is free. Okay. So here we have some veins because we are very lateral into the into the vagina, so we have the the vaginal vessels.
I think it is difficult not to not to open the vagina because then if the patient has still pain on the uh, during the sexual intercourse it is very difficult to to control ah yeah so there is no doubt the vagina <laughs> is infiltrated so i will open we take just a just just a picture because it is yeah i took a picture very well so this hist helped me to decide that i have to open the vagina and to remove a vaginal patch and i think it is the good decision the right one What time is it? So I have uh, so I have uh, an uh, an hour available or a half an hour. Okay. Um, between. Okay, like this. So we missed that part. Uh, was not. You missed something. A horse. Yeah, yeah. We we were just in contact, and so we missed the opening of the vagina. Oh, I'm very so sorry. So there was a problem. I mean, the uh, connection problem. That was. Oh, okay. sorry. So I, I told that. Le let it down. The vagina was like this, and by shaving the vagina, I opened a cyst, and I said that this cyst helped me to decide that. I have to open the vagina and to remove a patch, and I think this is the right decision. You see, it all, uh, there is a, a cyst here, there, and uh, uh, it means that we have to remove the vagina because uh, otherwise, if the patient is still painful during the sexual intercourse after the surgery, we have no, uh, we have not longer a solution to help her. So this surgery should be as as uh, complete as possible, meaning macroscopically complete. Very well. Well, oh, so as always, it's fantastic. Yeah, there are questions in the audio, and I'm going to translate to you. So he here, here you see the nodule is large. Uh, I have uh. a, I have a problem. Just a moment. I, I I change the glove. I will clean the camera. I will introduce our uh, colorectal surgeon who had a feeling that uh, it is the moment to come. Uh, Horace, Horace. Yeah? Yeah, two questions from yeah. the audience. I'm going to translate. For. The first one is that the uh, when you cut the bilateral uterine sacral ligaments, and it is, uh, is this the, a risk factor for the, the prolapse? Uh, the first one is because she thinks that the natural the uh, endometriosis uh, in terms of fibrosis is preventing and to um, the, the, the, the prolapse and when you cut and when you release all these areas it's going to be a risk factor for the prolapse of she thinks as I said uh, we have a young surgeons here the, the, the one of the young surgeons asked this question well uh, honestly I think that the prolapse and the, the endometriosis, deep endometriosis, are not working together because uh, the endometriosis and the post-operative status induces some fibrosis, and I think it, it, it is against the, the physiopathology of the prolapse. So in, in my Syria, I do not remember to, to meet a patient with uh, with uh, post-operative prolapse. So I think it is very, very, very rare because the post-operative status is responsible for a fibrosis which is comparable to that we try to induce with our uh, meshes or uh, our um, reconstructive procedures. So I do not, uh, I, I have never heard that one patient had a prolapse after the section of uh, uterosacral ligaments. 
but uh, the fibrosis still exists because in patients who, who perform MRI to attend, attend the, the postoperative status, you can see that in this part of the, of the pelvis where it is nothing at this moment, you will see a kind of uh, uh, a hippo, um, um, what, what can I call it? At, at, um, hippo T1 and the T2 uh, lesion, which is actually a fibrosis, but the radiologist always say to look, uh, uh, ask to your surgeon if it can be a uh, um, recurrence. So I think that this fibrosis will fix the, the um, vagina like this, and I think we do not have a, a actual risk of prolapse. So I will just take a moment to show to my colleague, uh, so uh, Marc-Olivier Francois, our colorectal surgeon. So we have a nodule which infiltrated the vagina, the parametrium down to sacral plexus and uh, the rectum. So the rectum is infiltrated on three centimeters, so I can, we can do a disc excision in the very comfortable manner. Okay. Uh, Horst, yes. the question about the, the rectal sigmoid and, and the, the endometriosis involving the rectum. The question is, what are the decision markers of your type of surgery and when the endometriosis is involving the rectal sigmoid? The scoid resection or the, the other options? And what is your decision marker? The question so is. On the mid and low rectum, I always try to perform a conservative procedure in order to try to preserve the rectal function and to avoid the low anterior rectal resection syndrome. Uh, we can perform a disc excision until uh, four to five centimeter, meaning that if the nodule had been large like this, we still could do a disc excision. To perform a disc excision, you have to dig into the nodule and to render a rectal wall which is very thin in order to remove it with a transanal stapler. If we have two nodules which are not far each other, I perform a colorectal resection. And but always I try to cut as short as I can. For example, in endorandomized trial, the length, the, the mean length of, uh, of a specimen, the of colorectal resection was uh, 10 centimeter. 10 centimeter, while in serious coming from over centers, you can see that uh, this uh, length may be 18 uh, or even, la even longer. So we never perform very, very large or long colorectal resection, and we always may prefer to perform a disc excision on the lower rectum associated to a segmental resection on the sigmoid in order to try to spare as much as we can the, um, the healthy bowel. Because if the patient has a low anterior rectal resection syndrome, it is very, very difficult to, to manage it and the patient will definitively uh, feel that your uh, surgery impaired her uh, health status. This is a very, very embarrassing outcome, the low anterior rectalization syndrome. And once you have one patient with Lars, uh, you will always try to, to avoid to have a second one. Um, now we, we also can do a shaving, but the shaving, the problem of the shaving is that uh, if the nodule is, is too deep and uh, the shaving is not complete, it means that uh, the deep endometriosis was not completely removed and you have a risk of recurrence and the recurrence after shaving is very difficult to, to, to treat with uh, probably a uh, higher risk of uh, complications and um, fistula and uh, so we, we propose the shaving only in patients where we are sure that we removed everything or in patients who are not very far from the menopausis in order to, to give them um, a pill to avoid the recurrence. 
until the menopause. The main advantage of the shaving that is that you have never complications, major complications, and you you never have a, a worse digestive function, meaning that the patient will never feel that she is worse after your surgery than before. And this is a very, very important point. So now I, I'm cleaning the rectal wall on, on both uh, lateral, lateral walls in order to, to um, prepare the rectal wall for um, the disc excision because uh, Marco will uh, use a we'll use a transanal stapler and the transanal stapler cannot catch, cannot close on a nodule large like this. It can close only on a shaved area. So I, I am doing a rectal shaving in order to reduce the thickness of the rectal wall before asking uh, Marco to remove uh, the shaved area with uh, a transanal stapler. This is the technique I uh, demonstrated uh, two years, uh, three years ago during your previous meeting because this is a technique I like very much, the disc excision. I have done more than uh, 370 and uh, I think the, the patients are uh, comfortable with this. The outcomes, functional outcomes are very good. So I do it each time as I can in nodule up to four to five centimeter. So here we finish to prepare the rectum. Hello, Dr. Raman. It's uh, Dr. Bahar speaking. I have a question. Yes. Uh, and considering the resection of the rectum, the dissections, and the opening up the vagina, uh, do you have any plans uh, like a mental flap or something to av avoid uh, fistulas? No, the, no there, is there, actually, is actually, there is actually a risk of fistula. I agree with you. But our, our policy completely changed um, during the last, uh, has changed for the last uh, four years. And I, I, I will explain, I will perform the this excision and then I will come back to this uh, topic and I will explain you how it changed and uh, what kind of reasons we, we have observed, okay? Thank you. Because uh, uh, Marco is, uh, is ready to, to remove the shaved area and uh, as he is between uh, two colorectal uh, surgeries, I don't want to delay him. Okay, very well. So Marco, we have to remove this rectal wall from there to there. Huh? Uh, 33? So we'll take a 33 millimeter diameter. Um, uh, Bach, you, can, you have to come here and to continue to untraverse uh, the uterus when I... Uh, when we work. So now as you see the rectal wall is completely thin and the disc excision won't be problematic at all. So look at what he does. So you know this instrument which is the circular stapler, it is used to perform the colorectal anastomosis. It has a shoulder and an anvil. So we'll put the anvil inside and we'll close the uh, stapler. And we'll introduce the stapler at the level of the nodule. And when it is inside, he will open, the Marco will open the stapler and I will push, open the stapler please Marco and I will push the rectal, uh, the, rec the shaved area into the stapler, he will close and he will remove it as a calzone. And once the calzone is outside, we'll open the stapler line on the calzone and we have a pizza with the, sha with the shaved area inside. 
Okay? Let's go. So, just a moment. Yeah. Come on. Horace? Yes. Yes. Yeah, you can. Uh, do you remember the, the surgery that you did in uh, the meeting uh, of uh, Mohammed in uh, Gadir? Uh, you were doing the same surgery. Yeah. <laughs> did you remember that? Uh, when, you, when, when, when, when? When? Yeah, I, I think two months ago, and in, in, in, in, it was in life surgery. And what kind of surgery? It was uh, also the same surgery. Your plan, yeah, do the same surgery you were doing, and the, your decision. Yes. The first decision is uh, to do uh, the discoid resection, and then you change your decision. And you don't I remember the decision, that. yeah, because uh, because the the lesion was too large, or uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah. happened. It happened maybe in ten percent of cases. It may happen. And uh, I always did it uh, a couple of months ago uh, in a life surgery for Moscow, where I started to uh, to perform a shaving, and then the shaved area was large from there to there, and we carried out the nose. So it may happen. But uh, in this case, I was almost sure, because I saw on the MRI that the, the infiltration is not very large. So I put a I put a stitch in order to close the the area and to be able to push it into the into the stapler. So now Marco will open the stapler. So the shoulder is still there and the anvil goes above the nodule. And now I will open. I will uh, close the knot, and you will see how. I, I will be able to push the wall area into the stapler. Yeah, it, it may it may happen to change uh, to change the the procedure. So it is always better to change the procedure in uh, a more complex than uh, not finding at all because uh, once. Uh, I scheduled a patient and I was completely astonishing to not to find <laughs> the nodule. I do not understand how uh, how it occurs because on the MRI uh, it was uh, almost obvious that it was obvious that there was a nodule, but actually it has been not. So sure. And on yeah. that case, he in, asked, in he asked me yep. to open the peritoneum here because um, we have to render. Uh, complete mobility of uh, of the rectum. Right. And we also will release the the colon from the telist because we have to avoid any any tension on the suture. Horace, I remember on that case that I am talking about in the yes. in the case, in the surgery that you did, it was not possible to pass the the, the tip of the the uh, instrument and the, and the, the proximal part of the uh, the blockage. That was you change your decision. Ah, yeah, probably. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. I remember. I think. Yep. So now Marco antevers the the stapler and I push down the nodule. Okay, you can close. And you will see that all yes. the shaved area will be inside inside the stapler. He should antiverse in order to avoid to catch the posterior rectal wall too. Wonderful. Very, very well. Let's see. Yeah. It's perfect. Perfect. And now he will close, he will fire, and he will cut. And you will see that the, the piece, the specimen we remove, is not a patch like a pizza, but uh, like a calzone, because uh, it is stapled, the, the superior and the inferior limit are stapled together. And we have to cut to open the calzone to have the pizza.
perfect. Marco, wonderful. So there is no tension. Look, look at the, at the, so the inferior and superior limit or, or, uh, and now he opened and we have uh, all this shaved area inside. Perfect. Very well. So, so it's the, the, uh, Horace, it's the first time in the audience that the most of the, uh, the surgeons saw this, this coitus uh, by an expert and they are deeply impressed and so it's really good surgery, it's fantastic surgery. Thank you very much. Um, we will check now that, uh, that uh, the suture is uh, correct, so he will fill, uh, I will fill the pelvis with water. Could you uh, reduce the Trandelenburg? Very dear Trandelenburg. So I will fill the pelvis with, uh, with water and uh, he will uh, inflate the rectum with uh, air and we'll see if we have some bubble. Okay, bubble test. No bubble. Perfect. Very well. Thank you very much. So, uh, I, I will completely remove the the tail lift in order to make sure that uh, we have no tension. Pans. What is the height of the lesion, of the suture? Uh, the the height of the suture is five centimeter above the anal verge, so it is actually a, a low low rectum, low rectum or mid rectum. It depends when you when where you put the the limit. In our uh, in our ex in our daily practice, everything is below uh, five centimeter is low rectum, so. Here we have a nodule of the mid rectum with a suture at five centimeter. So if you perform a corrector is action in this case, you may have a risk of um, of Lars. Uh, train, s'il vous plaît. Merci. Okay, very well. And now the last the last step is to close the vagina. And during I close the vagina, I will answer to my uh, to my colleague, because her question was very pertinent. So once I once I close the the vagina, we'll have a rectal wall and the vaginal wall not very far each other. And this it may be a risk of. Uh, uh, could you remove the, all this uh, tissue in order to avoid the... So this is the risk of rectovaginal fistula. Merci beaucoup. So uh, the idea is to try to separate them and to avoid that they are in contact. Um, from 2005 to 2018, when I was in uh, Rouen, Rouen was an, an university hospital where... Um, I was performing one, 100, the, the last year, one, 120 procedure colorectal endometriosis a year. And uh, um, the organization was uh, such that uh, the colorectal surgeon were coming from another uh, department uh, in another building, not far, but uh, different from that of... Uh, <coughs> of endometriosis center and uh, um, their policy was uh, to to perform systematically systematically in most frequently uh, a stoma when the rectum and the vagina were closed on contact so the rate of stoma in rectovaginal nodule 
I, I speak only about mid and low rectum, was as high as 60%. And if you have a look at the end of randomized trial, uh, the rate of, oh, I, I lost the, the second, uh, the rate of um, yeah. stoma was uh, about 60%. When I come in Bordeaux three years ago, uh, yeah, and the, the, the omentoplasty was systematically done, systematically done. However, we had rectovaginal fistula, which required repair by a second surgery or first surgery, and we published our experience in human reproduction and we demonstrated that the rectovaginal fistula may require up to four procedures, additional procedures to, to repair it completely. When I come in Bordeaux, here we are free uh, gynecology surgeon with exclusive activity in endometriosis. We do not do anything else. We have uh, seven, more than 700 procedures a year, among which 400 uh, procedures on the digestive tract. And we decided to reduce the rate of, fistula, uh, the, the rate of stoma. Uh, the first year down to 20%. And now we do not longer do it. We have decided do not to do not longer do it since uh, the, the COVID, the, the lockdown uh, with for COVID. And actually the rate of uh, fistula is not different at all. And we st also stopped completely to perform uh, the omentoplasty because uh, we prefer to have a uh, omentum, healthy omentum, if we have to repair a stoma, uh, a, a fistula. So this is our attitude at this moment. So this patient won't have uh, a stoma. And during the last year, I, I checked our results. We performed only four, four um, stoma, preventive stoma, in 400 procedures. Now, I do not advise everybody to do it because uh, uh, if you do not perform a stoma, you have to take particularly care to the earliest sign of infection or uh, pelvic abscess or fistula. So we ask all patients to have an assessment, daily assessment, of C-reactive protein and uh, um, white cells every day for eight to 10 days. And if the C-reactive proteins uh, rises the day four, day, uh, the day five, day six, day seven. We perform a laparoscopy in emergency uh, any day of the week. The Saturday afternoon, the Sunday morning, does not matter. We perform a laparoscopy and we check the, the suture. And uh, if we have only an abscess, we are very satisfied. We clean it and we perform, uh, we administrate antibiotics. But if you have a small fistula, we put the stoma at that point. And we had nine, last year we had nine, uh, nine fistula for the whole year. And none of them has actu was actually severe because in every case we we uh, had uh, management, uh, very prompt management, very rapid management. So this this may work because we are free uh, free gynecologists with exclusive activity endometriosis and free colorectal surgeons, which uh, help us. So the team is furnished to do this. And we accept, we know that from while to while we have this and we are ready to to do. But if uh, if the these circumstances are not uh, do not meet, I think in this case, in cases like this, 
uh, the stoma may be disused when you have a rectal suture five centimeter uh, high and a large vaginal suture. So this this is this is our policy. Uh, this year I will uh, report. Uh, I, I will uh, write a study comparing the policy in. Uh, in my past hospital with the policy 2019, 2000, uh, 2018, 2019 here with 20% uh, uh, of stoma and uh, 20 versus uh, 2020, 2021 with no stoma. And uh, we will observe that the rate of fistula did not vary, meaning that if you have a fistula, uh, performing or not performing a stoma is not uh, does not uh, impact on the frequency of the of the event, and it is probably better not to do it if you can attend correctly the patient and if you can uh, perform immediately a laparoscopy, because otherwise. You may have uh, several patients with uh, huge peritonitis, and uh, in this case, uh, you will regret not uh, not having performed a stoma. So this is my history about the stoma, from a high rate to zero rate uh, within five conservative uh, co consecutive years. Um, and I also proposed, I, I submitted, uh, uh, two years ago, I submitted a grant for a grant, a randomized trial comparing stoma versus no stoma in uh, these cases. And um, it has not been accepted because uh, the reviewers uh, found that uh, it is not uh, not interesting enough. And uh, fortunately, it has not been accepted because uh, we do not longer do it. Uh, and uh, this randomized trial is not longer in our uh, useful for us. Well, so this was the surgery. We can have a last look at uh, at the anatomy, if you wish. Salut. So we have uh, we had a nodule. So we had a deep endometriosis nodule infiltrating the vagina, the torus, the rectum, the parametrium, down to sacral plexus here. We perform a disc excision of the low rectum, five centimeter high. Excision of the vagina, uh, three to three centimeter uh, diameter and the complete excision of the left of the right parametrium. Here you have the right ureter, you have the right hypogastric artery, you have the right hypogastric vein with the branches. Here we have, uh, you have the plane of the inferior hypogastric plexus, the hypogastric nerve on the right side was cut, sacral roots were released, and here we have uh, the levator animatum. So the patient will uh, be we will be in our clinic uh, for three days. She will leave uh, day three, meaning uh, Saturday morning, and she will have for one week assessment at home, uh, white cells and uh, C-reactive protein. If uh, the C-reactive protein rises, rises over, over the four postoperative days, particularly over 100, the, the threshold of 100, uh, we perform a laparoscopy in emergency to look for a fistula. But the risk of fistula in this case is about three to four percent. So I think she has 95 percent, 95 percent of of chance to uh, to be. Uh, to be okay. I think that this case here will be treated by, cured by uh, this uh, procedure, the deep dyspareunia 2, the sciatic pain 2, so I think uh, she will have uh, well good outcomes and the possibility of a natural pregnancy because you see the EFI score is 9 
out of 10. So me, I, uh, I, I was very happy to broadcast this surgery. I had yep. two other patients and then I am eager to take the plane and to join you uh, tomorrow morning uh, for two days okay. of uh, Congress. Horace, Horace, you hear us? Huh? Yes, yes, I see okay. you very well. Actually, no words to say for your surgery. It's fantastic, Horace. And so uh, tomorrow uh, you're going to be here. And I'm, I'm talking about the, audi to the audience. And please um, feel free to contact to Horace to talk to the, the, the cases and endometriosis and the surgery, etc. Because uh, he's going to stay with us the next two days in the Congress. And uh, Horace, uh, thank you very much. As always, you did a very good job, m my friend. And uh, tomorrow, uh, what time are you going to be here? In the morning? Uh, I will be in Istanbul at 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, my, my plane right. uh, is at 4 o'clock, so I will sleep two hours and I will be uh, oh, fresh. Okay, afternoon. Uh, okay, tomorrow afternoon you're going to join the Congress. Uh, no, actively, morning, at 9. At 9, all right. We'll meet okay. together at the breakfast. Okay. Just uh, give your ears to the audience. Just like all the All right. Just, just a, last, a last mention. Within uh, one hour, you can see the whole procedure on my uh, Facebook and YouTube uh, channel. So if you want to see some particular steps, you can find the procedure there. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We are closing the uh, broadcasting and see you tomorrow, okay? Okay, see you tomorrow. Have a safe flight. Have a nice day. See you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you. Bye, ciao. Ciao, ciao.